This is a recording of Jerry R. from Visalia, California, taped at the monthly Saturday night NA speaker meeting in Visalia, California on August 31, 1991. In observance with the 11 traditions stating anonymity at the public level, please keep this tape within the fellowship and observe the anonymity of all NA speakers. Uh, Pam R. <laughs> I promised myself I was not going to say any last names tonight, no matter what. Um, I don't know, you know, like, some people in the fellowship, they just say their last name all the time, and then that becomes the habit, and that's what happens. So, about me, um, you know, I don't want to, like, go way, way back in my childhood or anything, because I only have 15 minutes. Um... It would take definitely longer than that. But I want to start, I want to tell you, first of all, I started drinking and using when I was 12. And, I, and it uh, progressed very, very rapidly. I was doing LSD and, and whatever I could get my hands on by the time I was 14 and 15. Um, and it was an everyday thing. It wasn't just on weekends. <laughs> and I went from a straight-A student to a straight-F student in high school. And it was like, it should have gave me some idea that something was wrong, and it didn't. And... Uh, so I progressed, and I got married, and I had a child, and I did all those wonderful things, and I still partied, and I did manage to quit using while I was pregnant with my first daughter. Um, and then after she was born is when I found cocaine and, uh, and fell in love. I was a big speed freak before then, but that did it. You know, like, that's what I had been looking for all along, and um, and it worked for a long time. You know, I used to, we used to sell... And my husband would send me out to the bars with all these bags of dope to go sell and make all this money. And when I'd get home, he'd scream and yell at me for being gone. You know, and it was like that that double standard and that life I was living just wasn't working. So I decided I'd rather be single and get loaded. So um, that's what I did. <laughs> and I did a lot of it. And I could go to the bars whenever I wanted to instead of when I was told to. Um, what happened was I ran into a girl that shot up cocaine. And... Uh, as I say, curiosity killed the cat, and I was drunk, just drunk enough one night to go ahead and do it, and I did it, and I fell in love. Um, and that set off about two years of major insanity for me, you know, running around with bruised arms trying to hide it from my parents and spending all my money on it and tell my mom that I lost my purse or, you know, like I had to pay people back, you know, and all those stupid excuses to come up with, and then hawking things like my truck. <laughs> which I did twice, <laughs> um, silly things like that. And uh, So what brought it to an end was um, I was living in a trailer next door to my mother and I was um, roommates with this really, really sick man. At least I thought he was really sick. Um, of course, I wasn't, you know. I had my shit together. And uh, I was sleeping with him, but it was like only because he had the dope kind of thing and I couldn't stand it and it was like really sickening. And uh, I almost nauseates me thinking back. Um, but anyway, we ended up getting getting into it over who had the dope and who didn't. You know, I mean that's what it boiled down to 90% of the time. And he was out, and I kept the trailer, and it was his trailer in the first place. And <laughs> so he moved down the street to his mom's house. And about a week later, my uh, five my daughter at that time was five years old. Um, came up to me and said, you know, Mom, I really am glad that he moved. And I said, why is that? And she said, because he hurt me. And um, through being able to keep my cool for the time being and talking to her, I found out that he molested her. And it just destroyed me from the inside out. At least I thought it did. Um, and it was enough to rock my world and, and hurt me enough that I put my daughter's life in jeopardy for drugs that I um, put myself into new visions. And that was December of, uh, no, wrong, October of 88. <sighs> oh, I was a sick puppy. Jack's back there smiling at me. Um, men were going to fix everything for me. You know, I knew they had the answer, and that's where I was going to find it. And uh, I did my damnedest, but... Um, I stayed there 32 days and went out the window at 12 o'clock at night. Like, I could have walked out the front door, you know. It wasn't locked. But I didn't want to get busted. 
You know, I want my plan was to go out that window, get loaded, come back in. And I'd heard the saying, you know, uh, head full of, because I was going to AA at the time, which is where they take you, head full of AA and a body full of drugs don't mix or booze or whatever. And went out that window with that girl and got loaded and I couldn't go back in. It just messed me up. You know, I was crying all night and walking the streets. And uh, so I ended up getting right back in the program the next day. And so that was a one-day relapse. And I made it almost 30 days again. I did get that 30-day chip the time before um, and then I relapsed again and then uh, I was out about a month and a half and I made it another 28 days or so and relapsed again and it was getting real tiring but the thing was every time I relapsed it took me longer to come back it, it made it that much more difficult to come back and sit in these rooms and tell you people I did it again you know and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to look at you guys in the face and say I got loaded again, you know. Um, and I wanted what you had, and I just couldn't give up the drugs. I just wasn't willing, bottom line. And uh, I wasn't willing to face all that pain. I cried over my daughter, and I cried over everything, and the whole world's against me, and I was a big puss is what I was, and trying to act tough. <laughs> and it wasn't a real good mix. So anyways, the last time I went out was um, due to that man that I finally found that I decided was going to fix me. And the old saying goes, you know, you walk into the meeting and you look across the room and your eyes meet and he's the one. And the sparks fly. And uh, boy, I, I had that manipulation down to a science. He was out of cigarettes. And I had some. So I shared and uh, so that started that off and, and uh, <laughs> like he didn't have a problem with pot you know so oh baby oh baby oh baby oh just bring me a couple of joints and we'll be doing fine and uh, so I did and he was in fine recovery and it didn't take long that we were both using and he was still in fine recovery and then it didn't take long <laughs> boy I'm really giving up some shit tonight <laughs> It didn't take long after that that uh, everybody else at Pine was um, at a dance and we were at Pine. <laughs> Anyways, I got pregnant. And, uh, like, if anybody ever tells you you can't get pregnant on the first time, they're wrong. Because <laughs> you do. So I went back to my sponsor and I was all fucked up when I found out I was pregnant and, like, I didn't want to have this kid. You know, I just didn't want to have it. I I was fighting with recovery and I was not getting serious about it and I couldn't I just couldn't seem to grab a hold of this thing called recovery and I was scared to death and I decided to have an abortion and uh, I told my mother I was going to have an abortion and that was really painful because she is totally and completely against it and um, through God's will you know I believe my higher power has been there all along because um, I wanted that abortion and I had one previous so I know, you know, like you can go down to family planning and get it all taken care of for free. And for some strange reason, that never crossed my mind. And I fought between the doctor and welfare. To get a medical card, I had to have a pregnancy test. And get, to get a pregnancy test, I had to have a medical card. <laughs> so it's like, what do you do? And I ended up missing the deadline to have an abortion. Um, so I got back into meetings, and I was trying to stay clean. And my sponsor kept telling me, man, you got to cut them loose. You're going to go with him. You're going to go out and use And I'm saying, nah, not me. I ain't going nowhere. And it wasn't very long that I did. And it was like I was sneaking around and still going to meetings and trying to hide it and and uh, shooting up dope. Um, so what ended up happening was we got into a big, big fight. And uh, what really happened was I got in a wreck, in a car wreck. And I was hurt really bad. And they wouldn't give me anything because I was pregnant. And um, that's kind of what helped me make my final decision, along with him throwing me up against the wall, um, to leave. And so I did, and I went to Farmersville, and I stayed there. Um, and what ended up happening was I ended up tricking for money to get dope and to support myself and to eat. And I ended up carrying my clothes around in a little bag 
because I didn't have any place else to keep them. And I couldn't take a shower when I wanted to, and I couldn't brush my teeth when I wanted to. And uh, I lived on the streets for six weeks. And um, that was a real hor- horrible time in my life. And I still, to this day, I drive through Farmsville, and I just get this big knot in my gut. And I start shaking and sweating, and it's like, that was not me. That was not me. Um, so I went into labor at 5 o'clock in the morning, and... Uh, my mom went with me and she stayed with me through the whole delivery and like the father didn't even know I had it and um, she was really sick she had a what they call meconium aspiration which is where they have a bowel movement during delivery only hers had happened a while before that and whether it was due to my drug use or the car accident no one's ever going to know but I do know that my drug use either was the cause or contributed greatly to it um, and it's taken me a long time to own up to that, to really, really take responsibility for that. So she had surgery the day she was born, and uh, they put this tube in her neck to keep her alive, to circulate her blood so they could shut her lungs down and clean them out. And um, I walked into that room with that little baby on that machine, and it was like it was over. I was done. And I don't think you could have paid me that day to shoot up any more drugs because I was just fucking done. Um, And I did my third step in that room, and I told God, man, you've got it. I can't do this. I don't want to do it. You know, I'm sorry, and if you just let this little baby live, I'll do everything I can to stay clean. And for the first time in my life, I kept that promise. And that feels really good. Um, So I came back to town. She didn't get to come back. She was in the hospital for three weeks. And I came back and I I went to a meeting. And what I did different was I came to a meeting of Narcotics Anonymous because I had heard about it before, but I never went. And the minute I sat down, I knew I was at home. And I seen a bunch of people that were just like me, that talked just like me, that acted just like me. And the only difference was they weren't using, you know. And I stuck around and I worked really, really hard. I got a sponsor. And I think 18 days, who in the past was, uh, we had like real close to the same amount of clean time. And I kept going out so much that like now she's my sponsor. So that old saying, be nice to the newcomer. Um, I'm destroying this gum in my pocket. Anyways, uh, I started working the steps, and, and what do you know? <laughs> they worked. <laughs> what a concept. Because I, I had worked them before, but it was like my way, and uh, my way did not work. And things started getting better, you know, and I got back with the baby's father, and that was still really sick. And I held on to that for, for I think, up, I was real close to 90 days, and he was still drinking, and I finally had to tell him, you know what, you can, you can kill yourself if you want, but I no longer want to watch, and I don't want to be a part of it, so please leave my life. And it took a long time to let him know I was serious about that, um, but he finally did, and he got on a bus headed for Utah and ended up in Massachusetts. <laughs> and he's still there, and it's like every every day I'm very grateful that he's still there. Um, my first year was real crazy. I was I was in the service. I got into service work at 30 days, and I just took off with that, and I kept real busy, and um, I took time off from relationships, which was really hard for me. <laughs> I didn't hang out at Fine Recovery anymore. <laughs> so, like, wasn't nothing there I wanted, okay? And uh, when I did go there, it was for an NA Pine panel, or it was to show the message of recovery. It wasn't to go find somebody to fix me or to get laid. Um, and the baby got healthier, and the baby got better, and at four, and at four months clean... I found out that my oldest daughter, who had initially got me into recovery, who I lost because of my drug use to her father, was being um, mentally and physically abused by her stepmom. And this program and the people in it gave me enough courage to go stand up in front of a judge and say, I can do this. I can take care of her if you just give me a chance. And he did. And I've had her ever since. Um, And for that, I'm very, very grateful. My second year has been uh, quite interesting. I was not in a relationship for 14 months, 
and for me that's a lifetime. <laughs> so I took a risk and I got into one and uh, what happened was it was it was good and it was very different. At first it was very boring. I remember going to my sponsor and going, man, you know, I, just, I don't know about this guy. You know, like, he does this, he does this, and I don't like this, and I don't like this. And what I come to find out was he treated me with respect and he treated me with dignity and he treated me like a lady and I didn't know what to do with it. You know, it was like I'm used to that real sick stuff that I was always in before. And it seemed boring to me. And it was funny how it clicked because my therapist had told me once, look around the room at a meeting and see which, what, which guys look really dull <laughs> to you and un unexciting. And those are going to be the ones that are going to treat you good. You know? So he ended up getting a job in Texas and I thought my world was going to end. You know, I was just devastated. And, uh, crying, crying, crying. Um, and I kept going to meetings and I kept talking about the pain and I kept getting lots of hugs and I kept putting one foot in front of the other and I'm still alive. So that saying, if you couldn't live without me, how come you didn't die, is true. Because <laughs> I didn't die. Um, <laughs> So, uh, another, <laughs> oh boy. another thing I did in recovery was I went back to school, um, and that was real, real scary. I started back uh, last year. I, had, I waited a year until after I had a year clean, and I went back and I took 12 units, and uh, I ended up that semester with a 3.5 grade average. For a drug addict, man, that shot dope up her arms every hour and didn't give a fuck about anybody, that's pretty good. You know, and it's like, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't, because every one of us in this room have that capability, and I believe that. Um, and I'm still going, and God willing, I'll graduate next May. Um, I've learned a lot out of this program, and most of all, what I've learned about is me. Um, if I put everybody else aside and uh, and really take a look at what's going on, it usually boils back to me and my issues and not theirs. Um, I've also learned to love myself a little bit. When I first got here, I couldn't look in the mirror. I hated myself. I put my makeup on with a little compact so I couldn't see all of me at once. And uh, somebody told me to look in the mirror and say, I love you, and I'd snarl and growl, fuck you. And it's not that way today. Um, I care about me and I care about my children and most of all I care about other people in this program. Um, I love working and doing things for NA. And it doesn't keep me clean, but it contributes to it. Um, I wouldn't give up service work for anything in the world. There's just so many benefits from it. Um, <laughs> there really is. You know, I said at the picnic over in Portobello that um, two, two of us basically put that function on, and both of us really worked our asses off. And I said, you know, I could go out and get a job that I hate and get paid money for it and bitch about it all the time. You know, and here I work basically for NA, and I don't get paid jack shit, and I love every minute of it. I love every minute of it. I don't care how tired I am when I go home at night. If I stayed clean that day and I helped another addict have fun, then I had a good day. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with all this, except the fact that uh, this really works if you give yourself a break and sit down in the chair and stay for the whole meeting and listen to what people have to say and if you keep getting loaded, quit doing what you're doing. Um, for me, I had to give up men for a while, you know, and that worked. But I truly believe that nobody's going to quit using until they're really ready, until they're absolutely really ready. And uh, I was ready, and I'm really, really proud to be a member of Narcotics Anonymous, and thanks for letting me share. And now for our next speaker, Jerry R. from Visalia.
she left me to come. <laughs> My name's Jerry, and I'm an addict. And I'm scared to death. I need to get all my feelings out of the way so they can stop being so big and tell you that, you know, my mind's been mugging me and telling me that, uh, first of all, that nobody would show up for this. And second of all, I'd start to talk about me and you'd all leave. And then when I saw the no smoking sign on the thing, it was like, I'm doomed, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and really what I know is I look out of, around this crowd of all these people and, uh, and I know like 90% of you, and um, one way or another, we've had a direct effect on each other's lives. And, uh, and I know that what I'm here for is not to build my ego, but to carry a message. And uh, I, I went through this thing where, like, I thought maybe I should get the basic text out and hone up on everything, you know, and read it in one night. And I was really mad at Pam because she asked me on Thursday to speak on Saturday, and there wasn't enough time to read all that stuff. And, and then I thought, well, I'll get all the recovery tapes I have out of my library and I'll listen to all of them and I decided that you guys probably wanted me to share my life and not someone else's and um, I know that I can't transmit something I don't have and if I share with you what I've heard on the tape I'm sharing with you what somebody else has and not what I have and um, I'm real honored to be asked to uh, look at their doing it um you guys are all walking around and leaving. I think this is like a sign. Uh, um, okay, where was I? Um, anyway, my head's mugging me right now, real bad. They're standing the doorway, thank God. Uh, you know, uh, I got asked to speak for the very at the very last minute, a ten minute speaker for. Um, warm-up speaker for the Valentine's Day dance and I remember getting up on that stage and looking down over all those people and feeling really overwhelmed with the crowd and taking a deep breath and having my lips stick to my teeth <laughs> and um, and really what I had to do was like just get real deep down into my soul where I believe God lives and uh, carry a message that I think he wants me to be here for because really what it's all about is that I believe there's somebody out here in this crowd today that needs to hear something that I've either lived or learned or read somewhere and um, that's going to benefit somehow from my recovery and I can only keep what I have by giving it away and I want to welcome the newcomers to Narcotics Anonymous um, wow I hope that you uh Stay. There's a lot to be offered here. There's a lot of love here and recovery here and happiness and hope. And boy, do we need a lot of hope. What it was like, well, um, I'm resisting the temptation to tell you I had my first drink when I was 12. <laughs> but that really was how old I was. And uh, I remember um, even before I took my first drink, how I felt and I felt like I didn't belong and that I wasn't enough and uh, that somehow or another I just didn't fit into the groups and the people, the cool people, you know, and I had this perspective about what was going on around me and, uh, and that like they were having fun and I was being left out and if I could just, you know, like be a part of that, whatever that was, that I would be enough. and. Uh, I remember the first time I got drunk. <clears throat> My brother still remembers that time. Uh, I think he put me in a four step. <laughs> um, I used to like to hang out with his friends because his friends were always doing things that I always wanted to do, and I liked to be a part of the older crowd and. And uh, my girlfriends used to look up at, at me because, like, I, I had this brother that was cute and he was played football and he was, you know, what we all thought was, like, the awesome crowd. And all his friends were the guys at the school, you know. And, and so they were having a party one day and uh, his best friend and my best friend were brother and sister. And uh, their parents were out of town and they had a party and... And I got a hold of a bottle of Colt 45 and 
before you knew it, you know, I was oblivious. And uh, most of that time was blackout. The rest of the time was spent trying to cover it up for my mom and dad. And my gro- my godmother was here from from Porterville for Sunday dinner, and uh, and I was absolutely polluted. And uh, I sat at the dinner table and tried to eat, and I walked with my knees locked together to try to cover up that I couldn't walk straight. And and I was spilling the food all over the table. My mom decided to serve peas that day of all vegetables, and. Uh, and I couldn't hit the plate with the, with the peas, and they went all over the place. And and uh, I had shoved so many, so much close-up toothpaste in my mouth that they couldn't smell the liquor, and they they just knew I was doing dope, you know. And uh, and they had me in the bedroom interrogating me, and and uh, and I remember being real frightened, but thinking, how can I get out of this? It wasn't anything that ever crossed my mind of that I shouldn't have got drunk. Nothing ever crossed my mind that I shouldn't have got drunk. Nothing ever crossed my mind that, it, that I had to look at what I was doing. It was just, how do I get out of this? And I was so sick. Oh, I was so sick. I got so sick. All day and all night, and I remember my dad coming up and taking me and putting my face in the mirror and saying, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Look what you're doing. And all I could think of was, I just, you know, tomorrow I'll, I'll be better, you know, and I can do this again. And, uh, man. Anyway, so uh, that was like the beginning. And, and what happened after that was that I, that I drank and started using drugs, what I believed to be recreationally. And that's what started my belief system of that I couldn't have fun unless I was using because I never did have fun unless I was using. And um, I started, uh, you know, my first drug after alcohol was not pot. And so therefore, since all the schools were saying, if you smoke pot, it'll lead to bigger drugs, I thought, well, I don't have a problem because I never smoked pot. My first drug was speed. And, you know, it was anything, my whole entire drinking and using career was constantly trying to find any kind of way that I could use or drink and not have a problem with it. I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now. And looking back on how I used and the way my mind works and how I used to justify and rationalize and, and in any way possible figure out how I was different than you. Because I thought other people was having a problem, but I didn't have a problem. And uh, and I was buying uh, nickel bags at that time of, of speed. And at that time, you got 50 hits to a bag. And I was using them, like, within a week and buying another nickel bag. But, you know, I was doing it to lose weight. I wasn't doing it for any other reason, so it was okay. And... Um, you know, these kinds of rationalizing went on and on and on, and uh, what ended up happening then uh, later on in my high school years was, uh, you know, I, I was really relating to what Pam was saying about drugs affecting her grades, and, uh, you know, I spent most of my time across the street, you know, we used to go across the street and smoke cigarettes and smoke dope and, and tell lies and stuff, you know, and... and uh, and that's where I spent most of my time. And I, we used to, my girlfriend Lisa and I used to eat hits of acid and see who could last the longest. And, uh, and we'd make bets on it, you know. And, and, and usually we'd make it like between second and third period. We'd see each other escaping out the opposite sides of the campus, you know, and, and tweaking big time. And most of my high school, I remember that I always competed with everybody. And this just wasn't in high school, but... You know, I'm kind of relating it to that time because I, I relate a lot to uh, my drinking and drugging starting mostly through that time. And um, I used to compete. I'd sit in a typing class, the girl next to me, and I'd compete with how fast she was typing. And if I wasn't ta- typing as fast as she was typing, then I wasn't good enough. I was less than, you know. And I did the same thing with drinking and using. If I couldn't drink more than you, I was a failure. And if I couldn't use more than you, I was a failure. And if I couldn't use and drink and still survive, 
and pretend like I wasn't using and drinking, I was a failure. Because, see, I lived two separate lives. I had two separate sets of friends. I had the set of friends that I used and drank with, and I had a set of friends that I sipped wine at dinner with or went went to, you know, business functions with, and they could never know. They could never know what I really was like. And I lived this lie for so long that I even started believing it. You know, I really did start believing it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself thinking that maybe I should, like, try to drag this part out for a long time because I'm afraid that we're going to still have time <laughs> when I'm done talking. So. Anyways, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move right into the heavy-duty stuff here. Um, when I was uh, about 15 years old, my mom and dad got a divorce, and I was left with the feeling that it was my fault. And I remember my grandmother saying to me, you know, if you would have just been better kids, your mom and dad would still be together. And I owned that for the longest time. You know, my dad was um, in a bad way, um, has back surgeries, and and my mom and dad were, it was not a good scene, um, what happened there with their divorce. And... uh, and I felt real responsible for that. And I didn't realize it at the time. A lot of what I'm talking to you about now has been found out through doing four-step inventory and making a resentment list and looking back over my life and finding out not only what happened, but why I reacted the way I did and what motivates me, what makes my mind tick, you know. And uh, anyway, so I didn't realize it at the time, but I wanted to escape. And I was... Running away, moved to live with my dad, and uh, I was mad at my mom for reading my diary. And really what it was all about was she was telling me that I couldn't do things and go places because I was supposed to stay home and take care of her. And I didn't know how to tell her that I didn't want to take care of her. So I made up an excuse, and I ran away. And when I got home from this party, uh, my clothes were all part of them on the front lawn and she had read my diary and uh, in this diary I had written about all the drugs I had used, about the cocaine I had snorted, about the acid I had taken, um, about the pot I had smoked, about the guys I had laid. You know, it was like uh, my cover had been blown, like I thought, you know, like they didn't know. And uh, and I was furious and, and, I, and I went to live with my dad in, here in Visalia and um, during that time, I was coming over to Lamore and Hanford where all my friends were, and we were going to bars, and uh, I was getting into this bar called El Rancho, and uh, and we would drink these big old drinks that had like, you know, 10 or 12 different alcohols in it in this big old bowl, and we'd just sit there and get polluted, and, and I met the bartender and fell in love, and a couple months later, I went to Reno and got married and moved to South Carolina all like within six months and I was 16 years old. And what I didn't know was that, um, I, you know, like I did one of those dope fiend things and I didn't get to know him first. You know, it was like somebody asked me to marry him and I was afraid nobody else would and I, and I didn't want to be alone for the rest of my life. Now this is a 16 year old girl thinking this, you know. And I really did think that if I didn't say yes, that this was like going to be my, my one opportunity, you know, to like live that fantasy of being married and having a baby and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, he was really insane, and I was really insane. I kept thinking that if I just do things different, he'd change. And, and I, I don't know really what motivated this man. All I knew was that I lived a life of violence for two years. And uh, and I thought so little of myself to not leave. And I let this man throw me down flights of stairs and, and uh, throw me in front of moving cars. And I can't believe I lived like that. And uh, the day I left, I had a son that was two months old. I had been there for almost two years. And uh, I was facing the barrel of a gun in my face and uh, you know just like it just came down to like that I just wasn't going to do this anymore I just wasn't going to do this anymore I just 
you know, it was like it didn't matter how I felt about myself at that time. It was more like I had this two-month-old little baby and I didn't want this man raising him. And if I didn't care about myself, I had to care about him. And and I picked up this lighter thing that was on the coffee table that we used to put joints in. And I picked it up and I smashed him in the face with it. And he ran down the hallway and I, and I grabbed this wrought iron lamp that was sitting on the coffee table and I threw it down the hallway and and I and I meant to kill him. I really meant to kill him, but he shut the door. <laughs> and uh, I ran through. I, I knew that I was in trouble now because you know he still had the gun. And I I left my son on the couch and I ran out the screen door and it was still uh, it was still attached. You know, like it was a real old screen door and it just went right through the screen. And I ran across the street to the lady across the street and. Uh, and I was knocking on her door, and I was screaming and crying. And, and uh, you know, it's weird how even when I was drinking and using, God put people in my life that needed to be there at that time. And this woman told me that she was a battered wife and that if I was waiting for it to get better, it wasn't ever going to be that way. And that I needed to think about what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, that I wanted to live like that. And it was like somebody that was there understood and I believe that that was kind of like a divine intervention, you know, that God put somebody in my path to save me from that insanity. And uh, so I called my dad like I had a hundred times before, and I said, please get me out of here, get me a plane ticket, I want to come home. And, and he said, Jerry, if I buy this plane ticket and you're not on the plane, don't call and ask me for another plane ticket. And I thought, i got to go now. And uh, so I got his my brother-in-law to take me to the airport and, and bring me home. Well, you know, I had lived in this chained environment for a couple of years, and I thought, well, this is my license to use. And I went insane using. And uh, my dad and I lived together. My dad helped me, babysat for me, and allowed me to party and do whatever I wanted to do. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like what brings me to the last couple of years of my using because, it, you know, I could just tell you story after story that really what it was all about it was it was real insane and I was real unhappy. And the last couple of years that I used, I started specializing in my drugs and I started, um, my drinking drug of choice was tequila and my using drug of choice was cocaine. And cocaine got too expensive and my credit cards were getting maxed out from the eight balls and so I started um, buying crank and using crank and then what ended up happening was all this physical um, signs started happening to me. I was in total denial of what my life was like as far as being insane but when I'd snore the line of crank my eyes would burn and my head would, I'd get these sharp pains in the back of my head and sharp pains behind my eyes and my nose hurt so bad and it would run all the time and, and I'd get bloody noses and you know it was just crazy so you know never thought to, I never thought maybe I should stop using I just mixed cocaine with crank so it wouldn't hurt you know that's what I did and that way I could have the best of both worlds I believed and, uh, and I used every day and I justified that it was alright because I wasn't using a lot and yet I was always in the bathroom or always in the bar and about a year and a half before I got here my brother um, got into the program of Narcotics Anonymous and uh, you know how he got here is his story but because he got here I believe that's why I'm here um, we had no idea that that there was a Narcotics Anonymous they had no idea that there was an Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, I just really didn't know anything about 12-step programs or that there was a way out. And really what I felt was that, you know, I still felt that I didn't have a problem, that it was him that had the problem and that it was my dad that had the problem and it was everybody else that had the problem. And I was going to Naranon meetings on Saturday night talking about their problem and how if they'd just get clean and sober that I would be okay. You know, I was there just to figure out how I could deal with their addiction you know I didn't want to look at what my part was or that I had a problem 
I just wanted to figure out how I could get them to quit or how I could get them to leave me alone, and it was always them. And uh, anyway, he ended up putting some time together, and I started seeing his life change, and, and I had moved in with my folks for a couple of months, and I had been there five years. And uh, nothing was getting any better, and I, and I turned 30 years old, and I had, like, this idea of what was going to happen for me at 30, and it wasn't happening. I was still living at home. I didn't have anything. I didn't, you know, I'd, like, paid off the bills and rent them back up again, and I was in worse shape than I ever was before. And I was comfortably miserable. And it got to the point where I was sick and tired of being sick and tired, literally. I was sick physically, I was sick mentally, and I was sick spiritually. And drugs and alcohol was starting to affect every single area of my life, as if it hadn't already, but I was starting to see it. It affected my relationships, it affected my workplace, it affected my family life, it affected my spiritual growth, it affected absolutely everything I thought, felt, or saw. And it got to the point where on October 3rd, 1988, I went to a hair show, and I was sitting in that hair show. The first part of the day, I was learning and using and learning and using. And the second half of the day, I was in the bar drinking and using and talking about everybody else's problems and how if they just get their shit together. And this thing just kind of hit me. It was like, where are you at? You know, I, I kind of looked around like, where are you at? And I got home that night, it was my brother's belly button birthday, and that's when I got the moment of clarity. David had been clean and sober for a year and a half, and Stacy was clean and sober, and which, by the way, she got clean and sober after going out with me one night. <laughs> All she could take, she gave it up. And um, my dad and my mom both had quit drinking, and everybody else in my life that was my problem was clean and sober. And it hit me because this was a birthday party. The whole family was there, and I was the only one loaded. And I was ashamed. I thought, you know, my... See, my whole idea that would have been the ideal way of using would be to use all I wanted to, and then, like, when I had to go somewhere, like, be able to, like, maintain like I had never used. That was, like, what I wanted to do. But it got, it got to where I couldn't do that. You know, I was wrecking my car, and I was, I was, I was a mess. Like, I couldn't, everything was out of control. And uh, anyway, so I asked them to take me to a meeting, and my first meeting with Narcotics Anonymous was Thursday night, October the 6th, 1988. And that night I had a couple of drinks. Um, I didn't get drunk, but I cried a lot. And I remember that first meeting a lot. I, uh, it was the first meeting that I ever been to that was for myself and not for someone else. And uh, and I sat in that chair and I listened to people share. And people came up to me and patted me on the shoulder and said, "Hi," and shook my hand and said, "Welcome. I'm glad you're here." And uh, and I was like, "Whoa," you know. And uh, and I listened to people share about how they felt. And I stopped listening to the differences and started hearing the similarities. And I could feel their pain. And I could feel where they'd been. And I, and I knew that I was where I needed to be. But I really didn't want to admit it. And I had all these ideas of everything I was going to do so I didn't have to go to another meeting. And, and uh, Stacy said, so you think you're going to come back? And I said, well, I don't know. I'm going to the horse races tomorrow, and I know I'm going to have to use there. And I, I got this going on, and I know I'm going to have to drink there. And, you know, uh, and, and really what it came down to was I knew I had a problem, but I was scared to death to tell my mother and father that they had another addict. See, because I always thought that my job was to be perfect. I couldn't let anybody know that I had a problem because it would blow my cover. I mean, now this is, this is the insanity, because I really believed I had a cover. And, and I, you know, I knew my parents knew that I drank a lot, but I really did think they didn't know anything about my drug use. And, and I really don't think they knew to what extent, but I think they had an idea something was going on. But it was really strange how it happened because the next morning I got up and my mom said, what did you think about the meeting? And I said, I got a lot of thinking to do. And she looked at me real serious, and she said, about what? 
And I said, well, because I need to make a decision on whether or not I'm going to do this or I'm not. Because I want to, if I'm going to do it, I want to be serious about it, and I don't want to go in and out, you know. And, uh, you know, I didn't know anything about prayer then. I didn't know anything about what the steps were all about, you know. I remember having an argument with my brother about powerlessness. And, um, and still today I struggle with that. But I remember him saying, you know, you're powerless over, you know, everything that goes on in your life. And I'm like, huh, I set my alarm, I go to work, I'm power, I'm powerful, I know I can do this. You know, it's like, I had no concept. And, um, but I knew that you guys were happy. And I saw the light come on in his eyes. And I saw things happen and change in his life. And, and I knew that I didn't like what I was or how I felt or where I was in my life. And I knew that everything that I had tried didn't work. And besides that, Stacy told me there was really good-looking, clean and sober men. And and I was really tired of going out with guys that didn't work and didn't have any ambition. And I figured I could find one here. Well, (laughs) I'm still clean and sober, and I still won't find one. That's not to say they don't exist. I just haven't found one. And uh, not one that, you know, like we have anything in common with each other anyways. And um, I have to clean that up real fast. <laughs> anyways, um, my first day clean is October 7th, 1988, and I have never relapsed since then. And... Um, okay. Um, and I'm not to say I'm not saying that because it's like you know pat me on the back and all that stuff. What I'm saying is is that you know I learned real early on here is to not to ever look down on another addict unless you're reaching your hand out to help him up. But I'm also saying that this is a program of recovery and you don't ever have to relapse if you don't make that choice. And uh, most of the time, that first year it was talking about white knuckling it and screaming. And I was on the phone a lot, and I sniveled a lot. And I remember the first 30 days was all about um, thinking that I had it. You know, I had it. All I had to do was suit up and show up, and I was cool, you know. And I just, like, tried to dive into this program, you know. And I smiled a lot even if I wasn't happy, you know, because they said, let it go. Let go of my God. And so I smiled a lot, you know, and uh, and I was like, they called me this, you know, a couple of my friends called me 30 Day Wonder, you know, it was like I knew what I was here for, and uh, and, and God had sent me to save you, because you see, um, I really did believe that I knew more than you did, and. <laughs> you know, this is coming from a dopey that was stopping on green lights and going on red ones. And, I mean, I just, I was so out there, and I thought, when is this withdrawal ever going to happen? And yet I could not get any kind of thought process happening all in sync at the same time. Like, you know, I'd be thinking about this, and the next thing you know, I'd talk to you about that and, like, totally confuse myself and you, and yet I thought I was not going through withdrawal, that there was nothing wrong with me, you know. I was just mentally addicted. And then it was like, at 50 days, I started going through all these sugar cravings, and I couldn't sleep at night, and, uh, you know, it was like... Uh, you could find me at Denny's at all hours, and it was really crazy. And at 90 days, I thought I could save the world again. You know, send them to me in droves. I'll save them. I'll save them. I'll lay hands on them. I'll do what you know, whatever. But I, I know I have the answer because I am God. And uh, and I had a sponsor that I said I worked the steps with, and really I worked the steps by myself until I got to the fourth step. And I knew I needed some guidance in that. And uh, 
And I did a fifth step with her, and what I found out today was that was really more of a written first step. And since then, what I've done is uh, work the fourth step on some really specific painful issues. And the first one was my marriage. About, I guess I had about, uh, I guess I'd been clean about a year or so, and I got a, a letter from my ex-mother-in-law asking me if she could see my son. She wanted to become a part of his life. And his father and, and none of their family had ever contacted us since we left. And uh, I was real bitter and I was real resentful. And uh, and I had to come to some kind of terms with this. And I knew that there was some work to be done around it, but I, I wasn't really sure what it was. I just knew that I was real scared and I wanted to run and I wanted to use. And, and really, basically, the only thing that kept me from using at that time was that this woman always thought she was better than me, and by God, she wasn't going to come out here and find me loaded. And uh, so I worked the steps on that, and, and uh, what I found out was that I didn't have to stay there if I didn't want to, that I could have asked for help, and I didn't, and that I am that I am all that I am because of everything I've lived through, and just because they were sick, you know, I need to pray for them. And I needed to look at what my part was and how I had used that woman and taken her money for a lot of other excuses that basically it was because we weren't responsible, responsible enough to raise that baby on our own and we needed somebody to help us. And so we came up with all sorts of reasons why she needed to give us money and I found out that, you know, no matter how she treated me, I had to own my part. And so when she came out here, I made an amends to her. And uh, what I learned about her was that she's just another sick addict that doesn't use. You know? That's all. And, uh, and then I had to remember, like, where I came from. And remember that, you know, prior to recovery, I didn't have any answers. And I blamed everybody else. And it was always somebody else's fault. And that's exactly what she was doing. You know, and uh, what I did ask her was to not come into my son's life and leave. So if you're going to come here and see my son, it's going to be by his wishes. And I'll put my feelings aside for him. But please don't come into his life and leave. Make a commitment to have a relationship with him. And she did that. And she's still doing that. And then I worked the fourth step on a relationship that I went through in recovery because I just knew that he was an asshole. And, and I, I, I had so many resentments about that relationship and all the horrible, horrible injustices that had been done to me. And what came out of that fourth step was that, you know, I resented the fact that I was not respected and I wasn't cared about and my feelings weren't thought about, I wasn't considered. And what ended up, I found out my part was, is that I didn't consider my feelings, I didn't respect myself, and I didn't stand up for myself. So how is anybody else going to do it? And I learned a really valuable lesson in that relationship, and that was that there was an abandonment issue I had that I didn't know I had, and I thought that I had to figure out what you thought, how you would react, all those things before I ever opened my mouth. I had to mind read. And the reason I had to mind read is because I was afraid you were going to leave. And, uh, you know, I found out I couldn't do that. And I found out that all the actions that I did to keep you there were all the actions I did to make you leave. By trying to smother you and baby you and pamper you and make your life wonderful so you'd stay with me were all the things that made you feel smothered and stifled and made you want to run, whoever you were. And I found out I do that in women relationships, not just men relationships. And I find out I did that with my son. And I hover him. And I try to protect him. And I try to rescue him. And I do that in relationships with men too. And so I had to find out how can I change this because I don't want people to leave me anymore. And um, what happened in that relationship was a scenario came down where I believed that everybody that I loved was leaving me and I got real scared and I was driving home from Porterville and I got to that 
that cross right there at Lover's Lane and Caldwell, and I thought, Marco Polo's just a shot away. And I was crying, and I was gripping that steering wheel, and I was saying, I just want to get loaded, and I was by myself. And that thing happened, you know, it was like, um, you know, it says in the basic text that someday you'll come face to face with your drug of choice, and, you're, and the only thing that will stop you is if your relationship with him is right. And, you know, it was like I wasn't face to face with the drug, but I could have been real fast because I, you know, a couple bucks and give me a shot of tequila and I'm on my way. And um, I ended up stopping at that red light long enough for God to intervene. And, uh, and I didn't use. And what I ended up finding out was that the worst person to abandon me was me, you know, and, uh, and that I had to stand up for myself and say how I felt and not to censor my feelings or to change who I am to keep you there because if you don't want me for what I am, then what do I want you here for anyway? You know, that was the lesson I learned through that. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect in that lesson. I just know I can pull that up when I get real scared. And then um, I went to World Convention of Narcotics Anonymous and I got to experience thousands of recovering addicts from all over the world and I got to see them call a country countdown you know and like you know when you see people from China and Russia and all over the world stand up you know it's like that's like breathtaking that's like when when it comes right down to the fact that you know is this where I want to be is this really going to work you know I can pull that memory up quick you know because it's working all over the world. And uh, so anyway, I came back from that convention and uh, did some work, recovery work, and, and I was real active in, in service work, going on H&I panels. And, you know, and, and what I found out was that, like, I was diving into recovery so much that I was using recovery as a crutch. And, um, and that's not to say that, you know, you can have too much recovery. It's just that you have to find what I had to find, what a balance was for me so that I could balance my home life, recovery, and, and my family life and my work life and all that all at the same time because I was getting real overwhelmed. And, and what I found out through that experience was that I was running from my feelings and I was running from who I was as a person. And I was really afraid to admit to myself that I was becoming accepted successful in my business life and uh, and so therefore I blamed all my pain on my business life and what I've learned through a lot of work in that area because I am a workaholic also um, that I believe that my work was who I was and uh, and that if I didn't work enough or make enough money or you know drive the big car or look good on the outside that I wasn't any good on the inside and Really what it was all about is that I had to own up to the part of myself that is, I don't want to really say powerful, but strong. And that, you know, it's okay to be successful and it's okay to honor that part of myself and it's okay to say that, you know, I do make a good living and I'm really proud of it and it's because of Narcotics Anonymous that I have what I have. And uh, and I don't have to be ashamed of what I have anymore just because you don't have it. And I don't have to be ashamed of what I don't have just because you have it. You know, and um, I got the God of my understanding here. And uh, I was explaining to a friend of mine the other night how I came to that realization of what my God of understanding was. And I always believed all through my whole life that there was some sort of God there. I never had a punishing God that I can remember, so it wasn't hard for me to accept the God in my life. But it was real hard for me to figure out, like, because I didn't have enough book knowledge on that to know what was the right God. So I was real confused about what my God should be or could be. And I listened to you people share about what your God of understanding was. And, and I heard things like good orderly direction. And I also heard make a list of what you want God to be and that's your God. You know, I heard lots of different things. But what I ended up coming up with for myself was that God was this kind, loving man who when I was scared I could sit on his lap. 
and say how I felt and I could close my eyes and I could go there in my mind and that you guys talked to me through God for God you know anyway and um, and then it was like a friend of mine that I grew up with his family all I can never remember not remember not knowing this family and um, he committed suicide um, it was close to Christmas time I think like in November of last year and uh, and I was real angry at God and I thought how could God how could God do that when there's an answer you know, how, God, how could God take him when there's an answer and that's when it came to me that God didn't take him that wasn't God's will that was his will and and that when people, you know, it's like, it's like I, this is, this is what I believe, you know, and this is like not in the basic text, this is just for me, and, and if you can use it, take it, if you can't, leave it here. But, see, I believe that we started out on the same path with God when we were born, and we were given all the things that God wanted us to have. And then as we grew up and we got older and we started drinking and using, we got on this fork in the road, and we made the decision to go over here. And then the more I drank and the more I used, the further I got away from God. And the why got wider and wider and wider and wider. And God was so far away that the only way he could get to me was if I asked for him. You know? That, that he couldn't see me that far away because there were so many of me. Just like me. Like you. You know? And like we were all in this big old step pool and, 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 and he was going, somebody speak up. And it, then I got to the program and I was still way far away from God and I still wasn't asking for him. But I was like visual, you know, cause I was in a smaller group. And then the more I worked the steps and the more I shared about my, my life and my pain and who I was and worked in recovery on myself, the closer the why got back together again. And I believe that, you know, all the pain and misery and havoc and all that that's inflicted on us and that we inflict on others is our will, not God's. And that I don't have to be mad at God anymore because it wasn't God that did it. He would have surely been there, but I moved, you know. And um, it's um, it's really strange how how since, you know, I get closer and closer to God, more and more lessons are revealed to me, and I know what they mean now by more will be revealed. And, um, you know, early in recovery, the first person um, asked me to be her sponsor, and uh, I've walked through a lot of things with her, and she's walked through a lot of things with me. And, uh, and I learned what empathy was instead of sympathy. And I learned about compassion, true compassion. And um, I learned about giving up my time. And I learned about sharing my recovery. And then somebody else asked me to be their sponsor. And uh, and uh, she gave me this thing called trustworthiness by sharing her fifth step with me. And... Um, and allowing me to be there to to help her through that and to share my step my, I knew about steps with her and what ended up happening through that was like I had to get real busy because both of them were outgrowing me and I didn't want them to cut me loose and uh, so I kept doing a lot of work around that and uh, I went through this thing not very long ago where I felt really inadequate as a sponsor and as a member of Narcotics Anonymous that I hadn't worked hard enough. I hadn't, you know, it's like I had all these expectations about who I ought to be by now. And um, and I really believed that that all the girls that I sponsored were standing in judgment of me. You know, that they were saying, oh, you know, because I'd listened to how they talked and I thought, oh, I can't be that. Oh, I can't be that. I, you know, I just can't be that. And I felt so unworthy that I knew they were judging me and I knew they were going to cut me loose. And what I found out was that I had been judgmental and that I had cut loose two sponsors because they weren't doing what I thought they ought to be doing. And 
that I had to make an amends to my past sponsors and tell them that their purpose in life was not to serve me, you know. And uh, I have a sponsor today that I I really hesitate to even call her my sponsor. We're really more best friends, and I'm working through the steps again. And I worked the first step again this last week, and, uh, you know, I had always thought of powerlessness as being what I'm powerless over, and she shared with me that it's not just that, it's that nothing has power unless I give it power. It's by what attention I give it, how much power it has. And that the only thing that's really constant in my life that is not, like, going to leave me is my perception and my attention and my perspective. You know, it's how I perceive things going on around me, how much attention I give to what I'm looking at or what I'm, who I'm with, and uh, how I choose to react on it. And uh, I don't know, I just... Uh, you know, I, I look back on who I was, and I see who I am today. And I look at all the people that I have in my life, that are still in my life. And it's amazing to me, you know, I heard statistics when I got here that only one out of three makes it. And uh, my mother made a comment to me about that when we were like 60 days clean. And uh, um, I had... 12 step my best friend who was also my drug dealer into the program because I figured that might uh, make my odds a little better at staying clean if my dope dealer was here and uh, and because I loved her and I didn't want to see her in pain anymore because I knew what that felt like and uh, and I don't know how it worked out but she has one more day than I do and I want to keep it that way and uh, anyway, so my mom said to the three of us that only one in three stays clean, and the three of us looked around and thought, who's not going to be here? And all three of us are still here. And about 60 days clean, I met my other best friend, and uh, one of those things happened, you know, where you're in a meeting and, like, somebody you don't even know, but you've kind of, like, been saying hi to, reaches out and says, Help. And that's what happened, and, and I ended up going to her apartment, and we're still friends today. And, uh, in fact, she's asked me to be the godmother of her baby. I promised I wasn't going to do this. Damn it. Ooh, five more minutes and I blew it. See, I tried to avoid that friendship subject all throughout this whole thing because I knew that was going to mess me up. And, uh, you know, I look out around this room and I see all the people that have been in my life and not just on the outskirts of my life, but really in my life. And, uh, and I thank God every day for that experience. You know, I, I thank God every day that I'm not drinking and using, that I'm still clean and sober, and that I'm honest, open-minded, and willing. You know, and I truly believe that with those three qualities, I can't fail. And, you know, I, I learned early on here that this is the only disease you can talk away, and I talk. And, you know, a lot of people have the conception about me, the misconception about me, that I'm like this real strong individual. And I've had people say that to me before, and I think... You don't know me. See, because that's the side about me that I hide. The part about me that's real small and real weak and real scared. Because that's the part that I think is going to intimidate you and make you run. Because I think that I'm going to become excess baggage. Too much trouble. And um, this program is not about hiding that part of me. It's about finding that part of me. And being okay with that part of me and letting you know that part of me. And some of you that are real close to me know that part of me. And my hope is that things keep changing. I used to pray for change to stop. And now I'm glad that there's always change. Because with change, there's growth. And my other hope is that somebody here heard something they needed to hear to stay clean one more day.
and I'm really grateful for the third tradition that states that the only requirement for NA membership is a desire to stop using because I thought that I had to use a certain drug or be at a certain level or be on a certain bottom or that you guys were going to judge whether or not I could stay and I was really grateful for that tradition because it ensured that nobody could make me leave here. And I'm really hoping that I've played some part in the fifth tradition, which is that my primary purpose is to carry the message. And, um, you know, I don't know what more I can say other than that I love you and I'm really glad that you guys didn't leave through this thing. (laughs) And I'm really grateful for the love that God's put in my heart and that you guys show me on a daily basis and all the lessons that I've learned to make me who I am today because I'm really proud of who I am today and Narcotics Anonymous gave me that. And thank you for asking me to share tonight. This is a recording of Jerry R. from Visalia, California, taped at the monthly Saturday night NA speaker meeting in Visalia, California on August 31st, 1991. In observance with the eleven traditions stating anonymity at the public level, please keep this tape within the fellowship and observe the anonymity of all NA speakers. Uh, Pam R. <laughs> I promised myself I was not going to say any last names tonight, no matter what. Um, I don't know, you know, like some people in the fellowship, they just say their last name all the time and then that becomes the habit and that's what happens. So, about me, um, you know, I don't want to, like, go way, way back in my childhood or anything, because I only have 15 minutes. Um, it would take definitely longer than that. But I want to start, I want to tell you, first of all, I started drinking and using when I was 12, and, I, and it uh, progressed very, very rapidly. I was doing LSD and, and whatever I could get my hands on by the time I was 14 and 15. Um, and it was an everyday thing. It wasn't just on weekends. <laughs> and I went from a straight-A student to a straight-F student in high school. And it was like it should have gave me some idea that something was wrong, and it didn't. And 